In Yu-Gi-Oh, continuous traps are typically thought of as just floodgates, cards that prevent your opponent from performing certain actions. However, that's not all true. Continuous trap cards have other effects than just floodgating, and in this list we're going to go over some of the best continuous trap cards in the game, with like half of them being floodgates. Starting off our list at number 10, we have Metal Reflex Line. This is a continuous trap card that has the effect when activated, where it can special summon itself onto the field in defense position. This card has 0 attack points and 3000 defense. Unlike other trap cards that turn into monsters, the only restriction of this card is that it cannot attack, so no sword and shield gimmick plays. Metal Reflex Line was a simple but highly effective wall for its time. The card was released back in 2008 during the dominant era of Dark Armed Dragon. During this time, boss monsters were mainly Dark Armed Dragon, the various Gladiator Beasts and Light Sworn Dragon, and all of them could not beat over the 3000 defense threshold of Metal Reflex Line. This even flows into modern Yu-Gi-Oh as typical boss monsters only have 3000 attack common modern boss monster staples like Zeus, Baron, or Shen Shen. However, the reason why Metal Reflex Slime hasn't seen more usage and is only at the number 10 spot is due to the lack of effect protection of the card. Metal Reflex Slime has no protection from card effects, and with the ever-expanding list of negates and targeted destruction effects in Yu-Gi-Oh, Metal Reflex Slime doesn't stand a chance, even during the time when it was released. Additionally, Metal Reflex Slime is still treated as a trap card, so it can easily be destroyed by spell and trap card removal like a simple MST. Although in later years, the card did receive an upgrade with the extract monster called Egyptian God Slime. This fusion monster not only has a matching offense to its defense, a Metal Reflex Slime at 3000, but also couldn't be destroyed by battle, could be used as 3 tributes for a tribute summon, and had a taunting effect for your opponent's cards. Metal Reflex Slime saw usage as a great wall to block attacks, although it was easy to destroy with card effects, and is kind of only the number 10 as a legacy spot. There's a lot of other better cards that probably could have taken its spot, like any of the Eldritch Trap Monsters or even Shadal Schism, but I like to put really old cards in the number 10 spot just to have an excuse to talk about older cards. And at number 9, we have Bad Reaction to Samochi. This is a trap card that has the effect that any life point gain that your opponent receives has the opposite effect, in that your opponent takes the same amount of damage instead. Bad Reaction is a unique card to say the least, as it's one of the few cards that changes a core mechanic of Yu-Gi-Oh! because it targets specifically your opponent's ability to gain life points. However, Dark Lord Nurse Refugule does share the same effect as Bad Reaction, so it's not entirely a one-off card. But regardless, Bad Reaction is quite the unique card. Bad Reaction really only sees play in Nurse Burn type decks because of the nature of how the card works. The Nurse Burn deck types are based around the concept of letting your opponent gain as much life points as possible while under the effects of Bad Reaction or Dark Lord Nurse. So, these decks would use cards like Gift Card, Try and Guess, and the Paths of Destiny that'll let your opponent gain 2,000 to 3,000 life points from a single card. Then, by running just three copies of any of these cards under the effects of Bad Reaction to Samochi, you can easily deal over 8,000 damage in one turn, resulting in an OTK before your opponent gets a chance to enter their first main phase. The Nurse Burn deck type has seen competitive usage in early 2014 to 2017 and has even multiple top 5 finishes throughout the years. However, with best of 3 formats and the side deck being the strongest it's ever been, Nurse Burn decks can easily be countered after game 1 with an abundance of side deck cards that can be added to destroy back row. But in best of 1 formats like Master Duel, Nurse Burn decks shine as you don't need to worry about a game 2. And at number 8, we have the classic Call of the Haunted. An ancient relic of old Yu-Gi-Oh, Call of the Haunted is the much weaker version of the classic Monster Reborn. The effect allows you to target one monster in your graveyard and special summon it back to the field in attack position. The downside to the card is that if Call of the Haunted is destroyed, then the special summon monster goes with it. Call of the Haunted has been a staple for a long time in old school Yu-Gi-Oh. There were very few cards that could even revive monsters from the graveyard at the time. In the early days, the only other card was really Monster Reborn. However, times have changed drastically since then. Since Call of the Haunted's Prime, there have been released a number of cards that can revive monsters from the graveyard. Typically, these cards are archetype specific cards or have their own set of drawbacks, like Oasis of the Dragon Souls. However, Call of the Haunted is one of the few cards that is out of the ordinary in that it's almost completely generic and can be used with pretty much any deck. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh, there are a lot of trap cards that can special summon monsters from the graveyard, like World Legacy Secret, Back to the Front, and the Deep Grave. However, in terms of trap cards that can revive monsters, Call of the Haunted is one of the best. Now, the issue with Call of the Haunted, despite its really good effect, is that spell cards that can bring back monsters are just in a different class than Call of the Haunted. A lot of the time, Call of the Haunted is compared to Monster Reborn, which is a spell card that has the same effect, basically, but only for your own graveyard. But the two cards are in completely different leagues. Spell cards that can bring monsters back are an entirely different story because of how easy they are to activate. 
which is why you see cards like Monster Reborn in competitive play and not really any of the trap card equivalents. It also doesn't help that in the current meta, there isn't really a place for Call the Haunted. With the abundance of cards I can do what Call the Haunted does, the slow nature of the card, Call the Haunted is just sadly too slow for modern Yu-Gi-Oh. But for its time, and especially in old Yu-Gi-Oh where the game was focused around who had the better beat stick, Call the Haunted was a great continuous trap to include in decks, and actually just still has a good effect even today. And at number 7, we have Crackdown. This card targets one face that monster opponent controls and lets you take control of it. While in control of your opponent's monster, it can't attack or activate its effects. Then, once the monster leaves the field, Crackdown sends itself to the graveyard. Crackdown is a relatively new card that has seen quite a lot of usage since its debut back in 2019. Taking control of one of your opponent's monsters has been, and still is, a highly effective way to dismantle your opponent's field. Once you're in control, Crackdown doesn't specify the monster can't be used to tribute or extra deck summon, meaning it can be a great combo starter. For example, if your opponent ends their turn with Nightmare Unicorn on the field while you have Crackdown face down, on your turn, you can activate Crackdown to steal the Unicorn, then use your normal summon. From there, you can Link Summon a Link 4 monster like Axe as Code Talker by using your opponent's Link 3 monster as well as your normal summon monster and attack for huge damage. Also, if you steal your opponent's Mirror Jade, the Ice Blade Dragon, and use it as a material for something or get rid of it in some other way, it won't trigger its floating effect because it specifically has to be removed by an opponent's card effect, which doesn't apply if you control the card. So Crackdown is a good card. However, because it can't be played from the hand, Crackdown doesn't see much play outside of trap-heavy decks like Subterra Control, because in terms of card economy, you do get a plus one at the end of the day, which isn't bad by any means, but due to the slow nature of the card and the endless negates, it typically isn't worth including in normal decks. Crackdown specifically targets one of your opponent's face-up monsters, so it can be negated relatively easy with spell speed 2 disruption effects like Red-Eyes Dark Dragoon. But if your opponent uses a negate on Crackdown, it might free the chance for you to use other cards with your opponent's negates used up, or you could bait a negate to then use Crackdown on their monster for a summon, or just keep your opponent's hands off their monsters. Basically, the card effect is so good that your opponent will want to definitely use a negate on it. And at number 6, we have Phantom Knight's Fogblade. This continued trap card targets one effect monster in the field and essentially makes the monster a ghost. Fogblade negates the monster's effects, prevents it from attacking, and monsters cannot target the affected monster with attacks. And it has this self-cleaning effect that most continuous trap targets have, that being when the monster leaves the field, Fogblade destroys itself. There is also another effect that allows you to banish Fogblade to special summon one Phantom Knight's monster from the graveyard. Fogblade is the more accessible version of a classic continuous traps that lock down an opponent's monster like Fiendish Chain or Shadow Spell. And what really pushed it above the other cards was that it's part of the Phantom Knight's engine. This engine utilizes Phantom Knights of Silent Boots as it was an easy special summon since all you needed was to control another Phantom Knight's monster. It could also banish itself to search a Phantom Knight spell or trap to your hand. But, even without the search effect, the engine could make some great plays. With another level 3 monster, you could XC summon Phantom Knights of Breaksword, which can detach one material to destroy one card you control and one card your opponent controls. In the combo, Breaksword would target itself as the target for your own destruction. Then, when Breaksword was destroyed, you could special summon two same level Phantom Knight monsters at the same level and increase the levels by 1 to level 4, so that you can then XC summon again and make a strong rank 4 like Raider's Knight into an Arc Rebellion Xyz Dragon. Or if you don't feel like going down the Xyz route, you can special summon Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche that allows you to send a Phantom Knight's monster from your deck to the graveyard to set a Phantom Knight's spell trap directly from your deck. Then, if your combo keeps going, if you special summon a Dark Xyz monster to where Rusty Bardiche points to, you can destroy one card in the field. Fogblade essentially removes the targeted card out of the game while it's on the field. As such, your opponent typically is forced to use their negate on Fogblade to keep the targeted monster healthy. An interesting interaction is that Fogblade can also be used on your own monster to stall out the game, as Fogblade makes the targeted monster not be able to be targeted for attacks, as well as not allowing your opponent to attack directly. So it just completely stops all battles unless they're able to get rid of Fogblade. At first glance, Fogblade seems to be a Phantom Knight's archetype specific card, but that's far from the case. Since its release in early 2016, Fogblade has seen constant usage as a common staple with the Phantom Knight's engine. But you do also need to have removal for Fogblade or the monster that it's currently negating, or you'll be stuck with a monster that you can't attack that completely stalls you out from attacking your opponent directly. And at number 5, we have Rivalry of the Warlords, another older card on this list that has the effect that each player can only control one type of monster, and all other monsters they control with different types must be sent to the graveyard. So when Rivalry is activated, you and your opponent get to choose which type of monster remains on the field and which gets sent to the graveyard. Rivalry of the Warlords is a great classic example of a floodgate as it locks your opponent's moves because once activated, your opponent is stuck with whatever they have on the field. Rivalry has been a popular card in monotype decks like Sword Soul and Waverns and Zombies. In addition to Rivalry, there are other cards like There Can Be Only One and Goes in Match, 
that have similar restriction effects that focus on having a single type or attribute on the field. It goes and match limits the number of monsters with different attributes, while there can be only one only allows for one type of monster to be on each side of the field. And since they're also similar and move around the meta in which one sees the most amount of play, basically all three of these cards are at this spot on the list. It's also worth noting that both you and your opponent can't use monsters in the field as materials to summon another monster of a different typing. While Rivalry of Warlords and Goza Match are active, common plays such as Christian Hockey Fibrax, Mega Phantabiz Aurora Dawn become locked off for both you and your opponent. So similar to Phantom Knights of Fogblade, adding additional spell trap removal isn't a bad idea. So you can see why some of these cards excel in monotype decks as they don't care about the floodgate. Rivalry, Gozen, and There Can Be Only One tend to be side deck options rather than main deck staples as these cards work on both sides of the field and can disrupt plays. But the simple and most effective workaround is just to activate Rivalry or Warlords on your opponent's turn and leave them with the choice of picking their favorite. Or if you're playing a deck that tries to win without using monsters, these are just great ways to stop your opponent from playing the game. And at number 4, we have Skill Drain. At the cost of 1000 life points to activate, Skill Drain negates the effects of all face-up monsters while they're on the field. With this simple but really strong effect, Skill Drain is one of the best floodgates in the game, as negating all monster effects on the field is one of the best ways to shut down your opponent's plays. Skill Drain is without a doubt a strong card, and has seen time on the Forbidden Limit list because of it. Nowadays, it's unlimited in the TCG. Skill Drain was initially placed on the ban list alongside Vanity's Emptiness when Cleave Forts and Burning Abyss stacks were the top meta decks of the time. Skill Drain and Cleave Forts synergize alarmingly well, as Cleave Forts monsters focus on Pendulum Summon, and when they were normal summoned to the field, their level and attack points got reduced. So with Skill Drain, their original base attack and level would return to normal. Then with their boss monster, a Plock of Fort Towers, a 3000 point Goliath that was unaffected by all cards lower than its level, including spell and trap cards, and lowered the attack of all your opponent's spells on monsters by 500 points to make it harder to beat over. So you can kind of see why the combo of towers and skill drain would be lethal. A 3000 point unaffected boss monster that lowers your opponent's monster's attack, and they have no monster effects that they can use to get rid of it. On top of that, other competing meta decks like Shadows and Necros got entirely shut down hard by skill drain. So Konami had to set it on the forbidden limit list, but recently it's come off that list. Even in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, the majority of Yu-Gi-Oh decks rely on monster effects to essentially play the game. And with Skill Drain preventing it, most decks get shut down. And with most destruction effects coming from monsters, decks have historically had to run forms of spell and trap card removal that can destroy back row cards just to counter cards like Skill Drain. Although Skill Drain lately has been associated with Eldritch decks in recent times, as most Floodgates have, Skill Drain can be used in a bunch of other decks but sees exceptional use in decks that have boss monsters that are unaffected by cards like Cosmos and Raid Raptors, to name a few. Although just be careful, if you activate Skill Drain before the immune monster hits the field, it hits the field with its effects negated. And at number 3, we have the devastating Floodgate Imperial Order, which is the only card in Yu-Gi-Oh's history to be eroded and still moved back to the Forbidden Lit. Imperial Order's effect is that while face up on the field, you can negate all spell effects that are on the field, and once per turn during the standby phase, there's a maintenance cost of 700 life points that you have to pay or you have to destroy Imperial Order. Now, there are technically two versions of Imperial Order the original and the updated version, and we'll get into that in just a second. Imperial Order is quite the unbalanced card to say the least, with a low maintenance cost to keep on the field at 700 life points, shutting down one of the most used types of cards in the game is quite the strong effect, especially when you get a free negate right off the bat when you first activate it. Now, I just mentioned that there are two versions of Imperial Order, so let's have a bit of a history lesson. See, when Imperial Order first came out, the effect was a little bit different. You only had to pay 700 life points on each of your standby phases, and it was an optional to pay cost, which meant Imperial Order could destroy itself, allowing you to play whatever spell cards you wanted if you so chose. This version of Imperial Order was so strong that it was initially limited back in 2001 and eventually moved to the Forbidden List in 2004 when the official Forbidden List was created. And once it was on the Forbidden List, it stayed there until 2017, a full 13 years later until the card got rewritten. The new effect was that it was mandatory to pay the maintenance cost, as well as you had to pay the cost during both yours and your opponent's standby phases. This distinction of allowing the choice to destroy Imperial Order versus it being mandatory is that you had to get rid of Imperial Order if you or your opponent wanted to use spells, rather than it destroying itself. The challenge was to find some other form of backroll destruction that doesn't use spell cards to destroy Imperial Order like Nightmare Phoenix or Artifact Sanctum if you plan to use spell cards on your turn. When they made the errata, Imperial Order did come off the Forbidden list and was limited to see how the new changes would play out. But as you can expect, Imperial Order was picked back up almost immediately by players because even if you didn't keep it on the field, it was a free spell negate for a whole turn, and it had to be sent back to the Forbidden List. Especially since there are a couple of decks that can avoid using spell cards, like Eldlich being a prime example. 
What makes Imperial Order such a terrifying card too is with side decks. By adding an Imperial Order from the side deck, you can shut down most popular spell reliant meta decks like Fluinda Rees or Invoked if your opponent doesn't have a counter ready for it. On top of that, Imperial Order deals with its typical counters. Most backworld destruction comes in the form of spell cards like Cosmic Cyclone, Twin Twisters, Lightning Storm, or Harpy's Feather Duster. So, with Imperial Order negating those effects, there aren't too many ways to get rid of Imperial Order easily. With a trap-heavy deck, Imperial Order basically protects you from the majority of back row destruction effects that are in the game, as well as locking your opponent out of their spell card base plays as well. So, you would have to add in the rare trap card that would destroy back row, or the more common answer was the effect monsters that had the ability to destroy back row like Nightmare Phoenix or Baron de Floor. But, players can take that into account and include a bunch of different monster effect negations like Breakthrough Skill or Infinite Impermanence. And before we move on to the next spot, it's worth mentioning Anti-Spell Fragrance. This card simply makes it so spell cards have to be set for a turn before you can use them, and kind of gives spell cards a trap card-like restriction. And even though it doesn't permanently turn off spell cards like Imperial Order does, it is used in place of it after it was banned, and was even used alongside of it when it wasn't. And for a lot of the same reasons, people played Imperial Order. And since they're both so similar, it's basically grouped together with Imperial Order, even if it's nowhere near as strong. And at number two, we have Ultimate Offering. This old school card allows you to pay 500 life points to normal summon a card during either your main phase or your opponent's battle phase. What makes Ultimate Offering so scary, and why it's currently banned in the TCG format, is that the effect is not once per turn. This means as long as you have monsters to summon in your hand, you can summon up to 15 times before you use up all of your life points. The modern day normal summon is unbelievably strong, and any kind of card, old or new, that can let you normal summon even just one more time is one of the best things to include in decks. That's why cards like Nightmare Goblin and Brilliant Fusion are on the Forbidden list alongside Ultimate Offering. In fact, the whole term Garnet comes from the Brilliant Fusion engine that would allow for an additional normal summon per turn with Gem Knight Seraph Knight. With all of the different ways that decks try to special summon monsters left and right and center to bring out their boss monsters, just an additional normal summon goes a long way, and with Ultimate Offering not being a once per turn, you can imagine the possibilities. A common old school example is with Athena and Onus, which constantly burns for 600 points of damage each time a fairy type monster is summoned, and Onus can return itself to your hand on a non once per turn effect. So, you could just pay 500 life points to continuously summon out Onus and just burn your opponent before you ran out of life points to pay. Another popular combo utilized the gadget monsters. Level 4 machine monsters that can easily search for each other, and then by using Ultimate Offering, you can make tons of different boss monsters by just having an endless supply of monsters to normal summon. The Ultimate Offering and Gadgets combo would be used in tandem with XE's monsters when Ultimate Offering was limited back in 2013. However, nowadays, if by some miracle Ultimate Offering was unbanned, not only would it see play with XE's, but with Link monsters, as it would be a piece of cake to Link climb and summon high level Link monsters. However, if they simply change the effect of once per turn, then we could possibly see a return of Ultimate Offering, and it wouldn't really be that big a deal. But right now, as is, Ultimate Offering is on the Forbidden list and won't see a comeback anytime soon. Although being able to summon as many times as you want in one turn is a great effect, in the opposite light, limiting the ability to summon takes the cake. And that's where we get our number one spot from. And at number one, we have another phenomenal floodgate, Vanity's Emptiness. The effect of this card reads, neither player can special summon monsters, and if a card is sent from the deck or field to the graveyard, destroy this card. Now, Vanity's Emptiness tried to balance itself out by having the secondary part of the effect, so if you had any cards that search, like Reinforcements of the Army, then Vanity's Empty would destroy itself. But to lock your opponent out of special summoning monsters is arguably one of the best effects in the game, and puts it in league with skipping phases of your opponent's turn, or interacting with your opponent's hand. It's also worth talking about Royal Oppression, an older card that has the effect that whenever a monster is special summoned, either player can pay 800 life points and negate the special summon, which is basically a less costly and more reusable version of Solemn Warning. Solemn Warning was a phenomenal card on its own, and has seen constant use since its release in the TCG. Like Vandy's Emptiness, Royal Oppression is meant to have the downside that both players suffer from the effects of the card. But like Vanity's, Royal Oppression can be used on your opponent's turn after you've already built a strong board, so you don't have to worry about your opponent using the effects of the card. To so easily restrict your opponent's special summons becomes invaluable when it's not a monster effect, because monsters take up resources to bring out and can be destroyed by battle or card effects, while trap cards take up less resources and can only be destroyed by card effects. And like Vanity's Emptiness, Royal Oppression is forbidden and has been since 2011. On a surface level, it seems like Vanity is balanced as it affects both players and even has a built-in way to destroy it. But 
you can just activate Vanity's Emptiness right when your opponent is starting their plays, and they can't do much to get rid of it. Then, when it gets back to your turn, it's super easy to destroy with any kind of searching card, like Reinforcements of the Army or Pot of Desires, which allows you to just not have to deal with the Floodgate. There are also strategies that take advantage of Vanity's Emptiness requirement for the card to reach the graveyard. With Macrocosmos, a card that banishes all cards that would be sent to the graveyard, Vanities can stay in the field for a much longer time. Or with the DDD archetype that has a monster called DDD Curse King Siegfried that could selectively negate a spell or trap card on the field, so on your turn you can just negate Vanities for the remainder of the turn, and then Vanities effect comes back on once it's your opponent's turn. But even if you aren't actively trying to play around Vanities, the ability to shut out special summons is still one of the best effects in the game which is why you don't see any new cards that prevent special summons, because the effect is just way too strong, and any card that has the effect of negating special summons has seen some form of competitive play, which is why Vanity's Emptiness and, of course, Royal Oppression are at the top spots. Royal Oppression is a much stronger version, but both of the cards basically accomplish the same thing, and are both incredibly powerful floodgates that are currently banned. Alright, and that's the list. If you think we may have missed any other super important floodgates to add to our floodgate list, then please let us know down in the comments below.